carriage will advance. Slow! The procession starts its long journey to St Paul's. The gunners of the Royal Horse Artillery in St James's Park fire 90 guns, minute guns. One each minute, one for each year of Churchill's life. position of the coffin is shown clearly by the brilliant white naval caps that go before it and behind. The Navy exercising its tradition on a sad occasion like this ever since the day when it took over the traces at the funeral of Queen Victoria.
when the army horses had kicked them over. Behind the royal carriages, the town carriage first, four Clarences behind, which bring the most of the lady members of the Churchill family, some of the men. And walking in front of the carriages, behind the coffin, you will see ten men in black, members of the family and close friends who are following on foot. We are moving up Whitehall, past the government buildings and towards Downing Street. passes the cenotaph, you see the banners of the Danish resistance being dipped before it as it goes by. This is the part of the pavement where they have their place. Force men moving through the picture are only apprentices from technical training command who have the honor of escorting the coffin. Here, the members of the family, Mr. Randolph Churchill at the front, and on his right, Winston Churchill, the grandson of the dead man, who lead as the senior male members of the family. And then you'll see Mr. Duncan Sands, Mr. Christopher Soames, Mr. Piers Dixon, and Mr. Nicholas Soames. Major John Churchill, nephew of Mr. Jeremy Holmes. And at the back, Mr. Montague Brown, Mr. Winston's faithful secretary for more than 20 years, and Mr. Peregrine Churchill, his nephew. And now the town coach, beautiful bays drawing it, containing Lady Churchill, Lady Ortley, Sarah Churchill, who is ill but has come from her bed today to her father's funeral, and Mrs. Christopher Holmes, who people knew for many years as Mary Churchill, served in the ATS as a gunner during the war. Do they look perhaps for one second at the house in Downing Street where they lived?
smaller carriages, the Clarences, one of which you see following the town coach, contain the other members of the family, or some 20 representatives altogether, and the Duke of Marlborough, who is riding in one of the carriages as well. There, we look up toward the Admiralty and Nelson Connor have a thought back to those days when in the Second World War, Winston Churchill came back to take command of the fleets at sea, as he had done in the First World War. And they sent out a signal from the Admiralty buildings to ships all over the world, Winston is back. Today, Winston Churchill passes the building that he loved and where he worked for so long and so faithfully brought past the statues of Lord Haig and the Duke of Cambridge, former Commander-in-Chief of the British Army. The first part of the Household Cavalry Escort leads the way with the trumpeters, the state trumpeters in their cloth of gold and black, their state cloth, and Alexander, the great drum horse, plodding his way on this cold morning up Whitehall. Sir Robert Menzies, the Prime Minister of Australia, the Earl of Avon, Sir Anthony Eden, you will remember, at this moment make their slow way up the steps behind the household cavalry guard which lines the steps into the cathedral from which later on you will hear Sir Robert Menzies talking of Winston Churchill when the, there's Lord Slim, a famous military figure. These are pallbearers who have the sad but very proud duty of walking with the coffin when it's received by the Dean and Chapter of St. Paul's. The procession reaches Trafalgar Square. It is nearly 10 o'clock. Archdeacon of London, Archdeacon Sullivan, who plays a part in this service and is also a Commonwealth representative at it. We come back again to Trafalgar Square.
bands of the Brigade of Guards marching in the procession play the music of a Beethoven funeral march. A whole series of funeral marches that they play on the way to St. Paul's. There's music of this somber, steady character all the way. You see the male members of the family walking, small, sad, black hatted group behind. On each side, now wearing their bearskins, the men of the bearer party whose duty it is to carry the coffin. Behind them, the youngsters of the Royal Air Force who act as its ex escort. Procession now coming to the top of White Hall, where the Royal Marines are keeping the route on its way towards Trafalgar Square. So the procession goes on and on its way. Let us move for one moment to the interior of St. Paul's Cathedral. Here in the comparative warmth and light of the cathedral, Parliament comes to pay its last respects. First you see the procession bringing Sir Harry Hilton Foster, the Speaker of the House. The doorkeeper immediately in front of him, the Sergeant at Arms with the mace of the house on his shoulder. These will be covered when Her Majesty the Queen comes to the cathedral. The speaker in his robe, black and gold, behind him the secretary, the chaplain. Then a second verger brings the permanent secretary to the Lord Chancellor, Lord Gardner. He too, preceded by the sergeant at arms, Captain Mackintosh bearing the mace, then the purse bearer holding the purse from which the speech of the Queen and the opening of Parliament is always carried, and the Lord Chancellor head of the law in the land, in black, gold, and long wig, train bearer and secretary follow him. As they go to their places in the cathedral, we too can return to the world outside. It's time to see the long procession, perhaps if I can to identify some parts of it for you, so that you know who are marching before and behind the coffin. We are watching now from St. Mary the Strand, and by that little church that we saw earlier in the middle of the Strand. One of the guards' bands that are playing in the procession along the route. Drums shrouded in black, the muffled drums of a funeral procession.
and in great contrast the medieval procession of the College of Arms, the officers of the college, the Percivants, the heralds and the kings of arms as they come out headed by Garter who just walked out of our picture to the left to take their place on the steps of St Paul's within the step lining party provided by the lifeguards and as you see there on this side by the Royal Horse Guards, the Blues in the background. They bring with them the insignia which are carried in the procession peculiar to Sir Winston Churchill and carried in his honor. These men, genealogists by profession, who now don their medieval tabards, who have the splendid ringing names of history, names, if you like, of Shakespeare. They take their place to add some color to what is otherwise, indeed, a somber scene on the steps of the cathedral. Coldstream Guards, all the Guards detachments are here, of course. Welsh, Irish, Scots, Coldstream and Grenadier in rising order of seniority. Part of the representatives of the headquarters of the Household Brigade. Behind the Coldstream Guards comes a detachment of the Grenadier Guards. The men you see walking fast and making signals are the Marshals, who have the difficult duty of keeping a procession as long as this in a perfect formation, all marching at the same slow speed and in the same time as they make a journey of two miles. volunteer reserve. This is a City of London unit. When it was first formed, its recruits came from the city. Now these 24 men and six officers in the background there represent the Royal Marines' connection with the city. Guns, the Royal Horse Artillery fire way back in St. James's Park. And now the Royal Marine Bands approaching, the guardsmen keep the ground here, their heads bowed, their arms reversed. This detachment of the Royal Marine Forces Volunteer Reserve follows the main body of the Royal Marines in the procession. 
here the president of France president de Gaulle arrives on the steps of Westminster Solemn faced with him, by the way, the new Grand Duke of Luxembourg, Grand Duke Jean. Because inside the cathedral, they're gradually forming the procession of heads of foreign states. Here, the Royal Marines come from the barracks at Eastney and the amphibious training unit and deal. Here, King Olaf, Norway, a much beloved foreign sovereign in this country. He is an admiral in our Royal Navy. The heralds, the Percivants and the others stand watching and bowing as the heads of states go by. The procession makes its sad and regular way towards the cathedral. Here, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands and on his right, slightly obscured by him, Queen Juliana, the Queen of the Netherlands, arrive together Frederick of Denmark, the Sailor King, as they called him, passes the heralds on his way in. itself from Portsmouth marches behind. Once again, the guns are fired. Procession of heads of state and royal representatives of heads of state makes its way into the cathedral. Prince Hassan of Jordan, the Prince of Liechtenstein, Prince Heinrich of Liechtenstein. On the right, with his cap under his arm, Prince Bertil of Sweden, the Crown Prince of Ethiopia. On the right, the President of Zambia in his own dress. On his right, the president of Uruguay, then the president of Iceland, and the president of Israel, that little figure walking behind the president of Zambia. Then, of course, the towering figure, in contrast to the president of Israel, of President de Gaulle. Behind him, with him, the Grand Duke of Luxembourg. Now, behind him, to the right, the King Constantine in the center of the picture of the Hellenes, and the King of Norway just on the extreme left of our picture in his naval uniform, the young face of King Constantine. Then Prince Bernhardt on the right and the Queen of the Netherlands on the left. 
bringing up the rear on the right the king of the belgians on the left the king of denmark We return once again to the Strand. Now we see Alexander, the drum horse, the state trumpeters of the household cavalry. And the first attachment of the household cavalry recognizable by their white plumes as the lifeguards. Back again at St. Paul's Cathedral in a moment. And we see the first arrival of members of our own royal family. of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who brings many other members of the royal family with her. Here's the St. Paul's Order of Service under her arm. Acknowledges the small bows given by the heralds and persevants. And now the next car that comes brings Princess Margaret, Countess of Snowdon, the Earl of Snowdon in morning dress at her side, her private secretary behind them. A long, steep journey these steps, the huge doors, the brightly lit interior facing you as you climb them. Back again for a moment to St. Mary Le Strand where the bands of the Irish and the Scots Guards together are making their way to their place in the procession. the Duke of Gloucester and the Duchess of Gloucester are greeted by Dean Matthews, Bishop Wand, there by the Bishop of London, Dr. Stopford, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Ramsay. Outside are the members of the royal family following the Princess Marina, Duchess of Kent, the Duke and Duchess of Kent, who've come back for this sad occasion. Prince Michael of Kent, just behind them. bearers of the insignia, here the chief of the defence staff, Earl Mountbatten of Burma, one of the few senior representatives who walks this whole distance with the chiefs of staff and with the Earl Marshal in the centre of the procession. Inside the cathedral, there is Mr. Angus Ogilvy. Preceding him must be Princess Alexandra. There's Princess Alexandra walking away from us, accompanied by her husband. The body. Winston Churchill has now been brought as far as this position of St. Mary Le Strand. And you can see, if you think about it for a moment, just how long and how big this procession is in honor of the dead man.
the steps of the cathedral, the city marshal in his uniform, the sheriffs. The remembrancer, the sword bearer wearing the fur cap of maintenance on his head, brings Sir James Miller, the Lord Mayor of London, in his magnificent ceremonial robe. He goes into the cathedral following the sword of mourning, one of the five swords of the city, this one black and covered in black velvet. There's the white-haired dean, Canon Collins behind him, Bishop Wand behind him, the senior members of the, of the clergy. Dr. Stopford, the Bishop of London, with the white mitre on his head, and the short silver figure now stepping to shake hands with the Lord Mayor, the New Zealand Archdeacon of London, Archdeacon Sullivan. So Sir James Miller goes into the cathedral shortly after greeting the Archbishop of Canterbury to come out again to the steps, and indeed you see the sword bearer has turned and is ready to lead the Lord Mayor back again, because his duty now is to go down the steps of the cathedral to greet Her Majesty the Queen when she arrives. gun carriage crew and its burden together are approaching now Fleet Street. That Fleet Street perhaps in which for many, many years when he was out of office and as a younger man when he was a war correspondent, Winston Churchill earned his living writing for the old graphic, the Daily Telegraph, the then independent Morning Post and other newspapers and magazines. Fleet Street, which, with which he had for much of his life such a close connection. The head of the procession, you see, the solitary figure of the Earl Marshal in his black coat and his white feathered plumed hat. He who has had with his staff the responsibility of organizing in a very short time the complexities of this sad occasion. It was three months after Wellington died before his state funeral. Winston Churchill, you will remember, died last Sunday. Procession now is passing St. Clement Danes, the Oranges and Lemons Church of London, the Air Force Church now. And little by little, here and there, one by one, you will see these faces, very young sometimes, sometimes not so young, but some wondering, some in sad memory, as they see the Union Jack and the coffin going by.
Lord Mayor, the big figure of Sir Paul Davy, the Remembrancer, standing facing him on the left, waits in front of the Guard of Honor outside St. Paul's, and the Queen's Color Squadron of the Royal Air Force. Color, you see, is draped, mourning black, bears the crown, and is the Queen's Color for the Royal Air Force for the United Kingdom. Clergy moving into their places far up in the choir. But this patterned picture has all come into position for the service, due to begin in quite a short while now. Far away, out of earshot, perhaps of those inside the cathedral, they're not out of ours. Those guns are still firing their one-minute records of the passing of the years of this old man's life. Attachments of the foot guards climbing the hill towards the cathedral. The Welsh, the Irish, the Scots, the Coldstream, and the Grenadiers in that order. from the top of the Dome of St. Paul's right down across Luggard Circus into the depth of Fleet Street and the newspaper buildings as the procession makes its slow, slow way. 65 paces to a minute. A little fraction over a step a second. Very, very slow. And as the procession approaches, so the time approaches for Her Majesty the Queen to arrive at St. Paul's Cathedral. This we shall see in a moment. For a second, we have this lovely picture of this solemnity moving slowly through the crowds and crowds of people on its way. Troops outside St. Paul's Cathedral are brought to attention Queen's Colour Squadron prepares to salute Her Majesty as the Royal Car turns into the forecourt of the Cathedral at the foot of the steps. lifts the morning sword color has been lowered Queen with her the Prince of Wales who has come from school at Gordonston for this day and of course His Royal Highness Prince Philip the Duke of Edinburgh in his uniform as Admiral of the Fleet passing the gorgeous tabards of the heralds 
the darker great coats of the household cavalry and enter the cathedral their staff mistress of the robes private secretary and equerry follow them to where the clergy wait to greet them and thus as she arrives thus does her majesty give precedence to someone else in the realm by not arriving last she acknowledges the thoughts today as she is greeted by the Bishop of London and now by the Archbishop of Canterbury she acknowledges the people's thoughts today are fixed on the man whose body is to be buried far out in the Oxfordshire countryside this afternoon and it is very unusual if not unique for our sovereign to attend a state funeral herself and thus do honor to one of her great subjects See the steepness of the hill that leads up from London Circus towards St. Paul's. As the troops climb it, coming out of the cathedral are the distinguished men who act as pallbearers. determined, although he was advised that he ought not to do it, determined to perform this duty today. Earl of Avon, Earl Alexander, the centre, here the Earl of Avon, Lord Slim behind him, Mr. Macmillan in the background, Sir Robert Menzies, the burly figure with a stick of Pug Ismay, Lord Ismay, who was so close to Churchill in the war. Lord Norman Brooke, on the right in the background of the dark suit, who was secretary to the cabinet the years just after the war, and behind Field Marshal Slim on the left in the dark suit, Lord Bridges. Secretary of the Cabinet during the war, one of our most brilliant secret, uh, civil servants. And on the right to Lord Portal, Chief of the Air Staff during the last war. Familiar faces, nearly all of them. All close friends, all close comrades of the dead man. And their duty is simply to escort his coffin into the cathedral and to escort it out again when the funeral service is over. They salute Queen's colour for the Royal Air Force in the United Kingdom. They are saluting now the Field Marshal Sir Gerald Templer, a young man comparatively who made an astonishing career in the Second World War in the Army, became High Commissioner in Malaya, fought the terrorists there, was a military intelligence officer and afterwards chief of the Imperial General Staff. You have in this small procession more than a third of the total living number of holders of the Garter. One third of all the Knights of the Garter are represented in this small procession as it moves out into the yardway in front of St Paul's. Once again, if you watch the procession, you see the banners of the Sink Ports and Spencer Churchill flying. 
as it moves this inexorable sad pattern coming closer and closer all the time to the point from which we're watching.
two banners. On the left, the Sink Ports banner. On the left, as we look, the banner of the Sink Ports. And with it, the banner of the Spencer Churchills. The one, the vivid and extreme color, bearing on it lions, gardens, and passant, and the poops of medieval ships. The other, with the fleur de lis of the Spencer Churchills on it, the fleur de lis of the Morgans. officers bearing them. The Earl Marshal, the background figure immediately in front of the gun carriage crew. And before him, with the plumes flying on his hat, General Nelson, who commands the London district. And over the top of the coffin and the crew who follow behind, with the Sinkport's banner and the Spencer Churchill banner making a foreground, the Queen's town coach that brings Lady Churchill. Inside the cathedral, the College of Minor Canons, the Archbishop's Chaplain, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Chapter Clerk, the Lord Bishop of London, the Dean, the Chapter, and there you see them lead the Queen's procession to its place at the west end of the cathedral. It walks at minute pace, slower, much slower than the procession outside. carriage has halted here is 
Lady Chen. To deliver this, our brother, out of the miseries of this sinful world, beseeching thee that it may please thee of thy gracious goodness, shortly to accomplish the number of thine elect and to hasten thy kingdom, that we, with all those that are departed in the true faith of thy holy name, may have our perfect consummation and bliss, both in body and soul, in thy eternal and everlasting glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who through thy only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, hast overcome death and opened unto us the gate of everlasting life, we humbly beseech thee that as by thy special grace preventing us, thou dost put into our minds good desires, so by thy continual help we may bring the same to good effect through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The hymns being sung at this service are all Winston Churchill's favorites. This is the American Battle Hymn of the Republic.
the New Zealand Archdeacon of London reads the lesson. Now is Christ risen from the dead. The river. Mourners who have walked so far in the cold this morning. The foot guards, officers as marshals at their side, their marshals' batons in their hands. Now come down the last sloping road with the royal carriages still at their slow pace just behind. City police, Metropolitan Police, who played their part in today's solemnities, salute the town coach as it brings Lady Churchill down to the town. Horses taking the weight on the sloping street that runs down towards the river. town coach and the four Clarences make their way down the last stretch of the hill to where you see the board that marks the entrance to Tower Pier. The mourners leave the carriages here and walk down onto the pier to await there the arrival of the coffin. On the outside, the young Royal Air Force men, the apprentices, the Earl Marshal, feathers of his cocked hat blown by the breeze, splendid golden batons in his hand, and his authority on this occasion. Turning the buildings of the Port of London Authority behind them, and passing the Royal Marine Guard of Honour as they too now bring the gun carriage down at the very end of its journey. Mr. Randolph Churchill, Lady Churchill on his arm, leads the family mourners along the little rustic footbridge, which then leads to the footbridges, which in turn take you down onto Tower Pier, where the launches are waiting for them.
the Downtar Hill, the sixty pipers, sound the first of their laments, my home. music that is played during this moving and intensely beautiful moment by the pipes is in its names sad and as beautiful as the time itself. My home, the Highland Cradle Song, mist-covered mountains, my lodgings in the cold ground, the flowers of the forest, the land of the leal, and Loch Arbor no more.
So the Earl Marshal has led the coffin out of our sight, down the narrow footbridge towards the pier. And there appear now these pipers of the five different regiments. The senior pipe major, the Scots Guards, brings them now to their place, to where the Guard of Honor stands, on the very river walls of the Tower of London. There stand by the gate of their own tower, the yeoman warders, the beef eaters, who guard it, show it to the public from all over the world, and are on solemn duty today. There, the Royal Marine Guard of Honor, the Royal Naval Guard of Honor, under the trees on the edge of the tower. Further away to the right hand, the saluting battery of the Honorable Artillery Company. And this greenness and these trees make a picturesque and perhaps even a tender setting to this departure from Tower Pier. There the strange little creature, half lion, half dolphin or sea creature, which stands now as an emblem of the Port of London Authority at the head of the flagstaff. There at half-mast, the house flag of the PLA, as everybody calls it, the Red Cross of St George for the city on the white background, and the PLA's emblem in the very centre, showing the patron saint of the river St Paul. And stretching far away in the background, the wharves, the cranes of industrial seaport London. follow close behind the coffin as it now reaches the linking footbridge that comes towards the pier itself.
stern, unchanging face of the company sergeant major Williams and the Inkerman Company, the second battalion grenadier guards who throughout today has marched immediately at the foot of the coffin. Royal Navy pipes the side as the coffin goes aboard. Haven Gore, its vessel for the last journey. watch from Tower Bridge far above as the river on the last of the flood tide goes by as it reaches high water and this old man who loved the sea and loved the water and loved ships is carefully now put onto the back of this ordinary working survey launch of the Port of London Authority to pass for the last time up London River and through the city that he knew and he loved. And even the jibs of the cranes of Hayes Wharf on the other side of the river are being dipped in salute one by one before the coffin goes by. All work, all movement on the river has come to a standstill. launch and the launch tame which lies behind. Now a moment of departure, deftly, quietly handled by the pier masters of the Port of London Authority. And almost exactly at the moment appointed, the last line is made fast. The river superintendent and harbour master gives the order and with the launch tame waiting behind and there stand mm -hmm. family some of them aboard it. So Haven Gore swings back on a single spring to hold it firm. Her bows swing away into the stream 
the waiting escort of police launches chosen for this occasion to commemorate the magistrates who first set up the river police. The Trinity House boat and the Nor, the harbour master's launch that lead the way. Guard of Honour presents and all salute the pipe sound as Haven Gore turns out into the river. Pipes sound their last cry across the water. The guns nearby sound 19 guns in salute, the first time that a commoner has ever been given more than 17 guns. A special salute for him of 19, echoing across the surface of the river with this little somber flotilla moving slowly away on its journey upstream. How slowly they seem to creep away upstream towards the bridges of London. Haven Gore flying the flag of the Lord Warden of the Sink Ports. The Trinity Houseboat remembering that Winston Churchill was an elder brother. And there behind London on this day of mourning. And the only movement on this bustling, thriving waterway of ours, this small flotilla. It seems almost to be drifting up the last of the tide at high water on its way to Waterloo. High in the background, one of those vast new towers that decorate London. St Paul's on the right hand. The cranes and wharves of Billingsgate and Queen Hythe. And one more salute to be added here. The